Grace and peace to you from Jesus, the one who gathers us and scatters us. Amen. Well, the fourth Sunday after Easter is traditionally known as Good Shepherd Sunday. I'm sure you could tell that from the psalm and from the gospel acclamation that we sang, have no fear, little flock. And I can appreciate the metaphor of Jesus gathering us together as his flock and caring and tending us uh, and loving us. But I don't know about you, maybe some of you um, have more rural experiences, but I don't have much personal, personal experience or connection with shepherds and shepherding. So this morning I chose to focus on something that I know much more about and am much more passionate about Bread. I found this in the back. I hope I wasn't reading the stock, but I was like, there was like a pile of bread back there. So the loaves were multiplied. And so I, I borrowed one. I think it's okay to push the good shepherd aside this morning. We'll see. I think he'll forgive me since Jesus himself uses the metaphor of bread when talking about himself in a pretty similar way to the uh, way he did it in this passage. He just sort of says uh, in earlier in John's gospel, I am the bread of life. A response to the hunger of the crowds that gathered for a share of the loaves and fish. You see, there is physical hunger and spiritual hunger, and often these two are fed by the same thing. A sharing together at the table where once strangers or acquaintances become friends if even for a brief moment. In the rural town of Edna, near the city of Hebron in the West Bank, I did encounter some shepherds uh, there, um, but I once visited the home of a woman who was part of a handicraft collective. I think I've um, shared some pictures and stories uh, about this experience in the past. But as happens when you visit someone's home, my team and I were invited to share a meal with the women there. It was an amazing feast, chicken and rice. It's a dish called maklube, which means upside down. So they, bake, they cook a big pot of it and they turn it upside down. It's all the rice and the vegetables and the juices from the chicken. And they shared also a particular kind of bread that I still crave 12 years later. I've never had bread like this since, and mostly because it's baked in a very particular Middle Eastern oven called a taboon. One of the women showed us how they bake the large, uh, round, flat loaves that were, in my mind, the star of that meal that day. They were chewy and pillowy, slightly charred on the outside from the pit oven, perfect to scoop up the hummus and the juices from the chicken and the salad. This picture of me was captured just as I pretended to abscond with all the bread refusing to share any with anyone else, to the amusement of our hosts, who you can see pointing and laughing in the background. Bread has been such an elemental food for humanity for at least the last 14,000 years. Every culture on the globe has its own. Flat or full, crackery or chewy, glutinous or dense and grainy. You could fill volumes of books just with quotes about bread, like this one that I found from Robert Browning. If you have tasted a crust of bread, you have tasted all the stars and all the heavens. In the book titled, My Last Supper, 50 Great Chefs and Their Final Meals, Jacques Pepin, who many, many of you know, and I grew up watching on PBS before cooking shows were cool, included bread first on the menu of his final meal. He said, I cannot conceive of anything better than the greatest baguette, deep, golden, nutty and crunchy, with a block of sublime butter, of the sublime butter of Brittany. So go ahead, I want you to imagine the best bread that you've ever had. Maybe with some really good butter or cheese on the side. How many of you can almost smell and taste it now? 
I smell bread right now. <laughs> this is my body given for you. Do this in memory of me. At Jesus' Last Supper with his disciples, bread featured strongly as well. In fact, of all the menu items they likely ate that night, it is the bread alone, along with the cup, that we remember, just as Jesus told us to do as he prayed over the broken bread. He knew that the best remembering needs something tangible to hang on to. Just last week, we heard of two followers of Jesus on the road to Emmaus after his death. They are shrouded in grief over not only the loss of their friend, but over the loss of what they hoped would be. And though Jesus walks along with them, telling them again about the stories of their faith, they do not really see him. That is until they offer hospitality to the stranger and they all break bread together. Suddenly, the risen Christ is revealed as they reach for a crust of bread. This must have been a powerful experience of what the sharing of a meal can do for weary and grief-filled hearts. Because the followers of Christ continue to this day to make sharing bread a central practice of our faith. In the book of Acts that Kurt read uh, the passage from today, we get a snapshot of the faith practice of those earliest followers of Jesus. They devoted themselves to four things. The apostles' teaching, fellowship, the breaking of the bread, and prayers. And it isn't hard to see in this the building blocks of our own worship 2,000 years since. Today is First Communion Sunday, when a group of young people will be welcomed to the table to receive the broken bread with us. It is a privilege to be sure, but it does not end with the gifts of bread and wine received by us as individuals. We gather around this table in community, glimpsing the risen Christ in our midst, only to be scattered out into the world like crumbs and shards from the best loaf of bread, broken to be shared with a hungering world. In her book, For All Who Hunger, my colleague and friend Emily Scott writes, the table gathers but resurrection, it turns out, scatters. Jesus gathers people around tables, but he also sends them out on roads. For every meal he shared, every drawing together around a heavy, laden table, there was a call to travel an unknown path. He sends us to figure it out as we go, teaching or healing or starting churches or just muddling through. Along the way, though, there are tables. I learned important lessons breaking bread around Palestinian tables. The women of that cooperative all had stories of hardship. Husbands that had been arrested, breadwinners taken away, leaving them and their young children vulnerable. The constant anxiety of military occupation wondering about what future was possibly available for their families and generations to come. But in the moment when a stranger happened on the doorstep, hospitality became its own expression of abundant life. And breaking bread together revealed a common humanity and a a joy in sharing the very simplest of gifts. The stranger, no longer a stranger but an honored guest, and perhaps a friend. Over just this last month, the month of April, four random shootings in our country have happened because people rang the wrong doorbell, or entered the wrong driveway, or dared to lose a ball in a neighbor's yard. These have made that old trope of neighborliness to knock on the door next to yours to borrow a cup of flour, a risky proposition. In these times, it can be hard to imagine what it could look like if neighbors opened their door for the stranger. The truth is, there is deep 
spiritual hunger outside these walls. Deep spiritual hunger in here as well. But the difference is that in here we are fed and nourished again at this table. Gathered by the Holy Spirit as the flock of the good shepherd. Fed at the table by his own body given. And then scattered out into the world. A world that needs us now as much as it ever has. This has been the movement of our faith from the very first visions of the risen Christ among the community of believers. To be gathered in together in prayer, teaching, and the meal. And to be sent out as transformers of our world. Breaking bread is a metaphor for human community. And here we believe that to taste even a crumb or a crust of bread among the faithful gathered in Jesus' name opens us to a reality beyond our ability to comprehend. In this meal, we taste the very means of salvation, hearing again the promise of what happens when God has given away God's own body and blood for the sake of the world. And we are told, do this in memory of me. When we say at the end of every worship service here at St. John's, go in peace, serve the Lord, and live God's love in the world, we are giving one another that last reminder before we exit this place into the world that we do not share the meal for ourselves alone, but through it we become what we share together, Christ's body given for us and for others, living bread, broken to satisfy a hungry world. Thanks be to God. Amen.